It's time to talk Gonzaga basketball. Get ready. It's the Spoke Review Zags Insiders Podcast. Here we go. Here's Jim Meehan and Richard Fox. Good Monday morning. Welcome to the Zags Basketball Insiders Podcast. Jim Meehan from the Spokesman Review. Richard Fox from TV World. He's an analyst for Gonzaga Basketball. SWX, Root, KHQ. And we're back with another week of uh, Gonzaga Nation hoops here. That What they've done and what they're about to do. What's coming up. Uh, polls are just coming out. The coaches poll came out uh, a few minutes ago. And Gonzaga, as I expected, moved up one spot. They are number four there. You've got Kansas, UConn, and Auburn in front of them. The AP poll hadn't come out yet. I fully expect the Zags to be third there after Alabama's loss. Uh, They will drop down, I would assume. And you'd have Kansas, UConn, and Gonzaga. So that's where they stand in the rankings. Uh, Where they stand this week, tough week. San Diego State tonight at Viejas Arena. Tough place to play basketball for visitors. And then a game with Long Beach State, which probably would have been a lot more enticing if Dan Monson were still the head coach at Long Beach State, but he has moved on and is now at Eastern Washington. So we'll talk about both those games. Uh, We'll catch you up a little bit on uh, last week, and then we'll dive into some other topics. Foxy, UMass Lowell came into uh, the McCarthy Athletic Center. Uh, team that's picked second in the America East Conference, team that's won 22 and 26 games the last two years, bunch of older guys, a promising outlook, uh, really could not match up with Gonzaga outside or inside. A game they lose by 59 points. Two days later, they give Washington fifths, lose by five over in Seattle. What was your takeaway from that first game against uh, UMass Low first game for you on the on the call this year, right? Yeah, yeah, we're a little rusty, but we'll be all right. Um, well, I mean, what stood out to me was just that defensively. I mean, that's a really mature group for UMass Lowell, and to turn them over twenty five times to me was really impressive. Um, and and that that to me was the story. I mean, that's a team very uh, perimeter centric. Um, as I was saying, you know, a lot of experience, um, and it wasn't and coughed it up um, just kind of willingly. I mean, I thought Gonzaga just made them really uncomfortable, did a good job jumping, passing lanes, that kind of thing. Um, I mean, for the game, you know, sub – or in the first half, rather, UMass low sub 42% from the field, two of eight from the three-point line. You know, Gonzaga 32 points off of those 25 turnovers, 36 points in transition. Just, you know, completely dominated, that dominated the game on that end. And I thought – a good reminder that you know defense is what can carry you when you struggle offensively. Um, you know Gonzaga excellent from the three point line, six of thirteen, but overall forty four percent and only forty two percent inside the three point line in the first half. I thought Gonzaga's bigs really struggled to finish around the basket. Um, you know, just kind of it was jarring to see, particularly Huff and Ek just miss some point blank shots. Um, but it was the defense and the ability to knock down the three-point shot. And, um, you know, Gonzaga's guards have been exceptional throughout the year, but I I was kind of interested, Jim, so I went back and looked. Against Baylor, Gonzaga's big 47 points. I'm I'm talking about the the, the eight-man rotation now. 47 points, the guards 46. Against Arizona State, the bigs 41 points, guards 47. Against UMass Lowell, uh, the guards had 59 points versus the bigs with just 37 yeah. Um, and I, you know, I think over the last few years, particularly the last, uh, last couple, it's been very, very, you know, the, the scoring load has been dominated inside because of Drew Timmy, um, and you know, Watson and that, and then EK. And I think they've got, it just shows you a, the balance they have offensively, but also if they have a night like that and the inverse could be true too, you think you could have a game where you just can't buy a three pointer from your backcourt. They've got the firepower up front, but just, you know, I thought it was an interesting kind of nugget, you know, early in the year, certainly to, to take too much from it. But, um, you know, the bigs didn't have the night we would have expected, I think. 
given yeah. the, the the size advantage, but you've got more than enough firepower on the perimeter to make up for that. Yeah, uh, AP poll just moved. Gonzaga is number three behind Kansas and UConn. Uh, back to UMass Lowell. Um, I, I think one of the things you're seeing too is the Zags are playing more two bigs, three guards. Yeah, uh, fair enough. Fair. Playing, playing into the scoring. You know, when you have battle at the wing, basically is the three man. Uh, not uh, they now they did start three bigs earlier th- this year, but. Uh, so that'll play with the scoring, but they, they've got firepower at all five spots. And then the three they bring in off the bench, bring some as well. Uh, I just mentioned battle. This kid is off to a pretty good start. Uh, first year transfer from Arkansas. He just has this Vinnie Johnson microwave scoring ability. And the Zags have had that in the past. Uh, Zach Norvell could really put up 20 and a half without him blinking. And then, uh, guys like Malachi Smith could really fill it up uh, in a short amount of time, but but this guy may take it to the extremes. When he gets hot, look out. Uh, the three ball starts dropping. He has not missed a free throw this year. Uh, I think he's around a 90% career shooter or just under it at the line. And he guarded, uh, which was interesting to me, Quentin Mincy, who's uh, UMass Lowe's best kid and had two 20-point games coming in. He's that 6'5", 6'6", guy that uh, can bounce it, can shoot it. And clearly that's who they want to run it through, their offense. He did a pretty good job on Mincy. Mincy had a tough night. I think he had six turnovers, uh, 10 points. But he shot, I think, uh, 0 for 3 on threes. Uh, What do you make – and this battle now is entertaining. He's fun in the media room. He's – He's fun just to watch out there. What what do you make of this kid and his start and and what he means to this club? Well, I mean, and what what was more, when's he averaging twenty four coming in? Right, I mean, it was, you know, the first couple of games. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Twenty three and a half. Yeah. Um, I think he has been everything and then some that they could have you know could have hoped. I mean, the fit seems pretty seamless. Uh, Minutes per game, just under 30. Leads them in scoring, but really, really efficient. He's shooting 11 of 18 from the three-point line. I'm not sure we're going to expect that all year, that clip. Um, But what impresses me is he seemed very committed to the defensive end. And he has something that, you know, Dusty has a a bit of it. And then Dusty has a similar length. But Dusty doesn't have the strength that that Battle does physically. And so, you know... Battle rep- represents a wing that Gonzaga hasn't had a lot of in the past, which is a guy who can create his own shot, has legitimate NBA size, at, you know, all a six five, you know, two ten. Or I mean, he looks bigger than what what they list him. Um, he's uh, a good athlete, major athlete. But when if he can stay committed to to really being their primary defender for larger wings, yeah. it's easier. Um, and I, I I just like that he's not forcing his shots. You know, I, that's pro- it was probably not a fair assumption to make that he was going to come in and be a gunner. I think with just how Arkansas played and you know playing for muscleman's a different experience i think you know you don't necessarily know night to night what your what your role is going to be and it, it's probably somewhat dependent on if you're making shots i think mark's going to give him time to to get into the offense you know you can tell there's no there's no he doesn't have this urge to immediately have an impact offensively he's letting that the game come to him and they don't need him to go score they need him to be himself and be aggressive, and he needs to look to score, but he doesn't have to force anything. I mean, I, I, I honestly can only think of one shot, one play where he forced it, and that was a drive against Baylor in the first half where he just, you know, there was too much traffic. He lost it. But other than that, he's just played within himself, and, boy, he gets it out quick, too. When he when he gets his feet under him, then that ball is gone. And he yeah. he lifts or he, he, he raises up with his jump, you know, higher than most kids do. So he it's very difficult to bother him when he when he gets into his jump shot. So I mean we it, it's been a, a seamless transition for him. And he is uh the type of piece 
over the last 25 years. I mean, he's pretty, it's pretty unique, the skill set and the ability that he's bringing to, to the program right now. Yeah, it's, uh, it's impressive. And he does kind of ease his way into games. I don't remember him shooting very much early on, kind of in that first shift where you go to the media timeouts and then Dusty might come in. But boy, in the second half, he's been very good and very willing to guard. I think that's probably the best sign uh, the Zags coaches were looking for. And, and uh, when you have the want to, I think you can get it done on the defensive end with his physical ability. That uh, That's a pretty good combo. Uh, we'll have business at hand here, Foxy, is San Diego State. This is a, a marquee game, huge game this week. Uh, you've got the, uh, the team that's kind of ruled the – uh, the Mountain West Conference for the most part at or near the top for, oh, 10, 12 years at least with Brian Dutcher at the helm. And they took care of the Zags last year at the McCarthy, 84-74, very physical, tough, defensive-minded team. They will be again tonight. You know that's coming. A lot of different personnel, but let's start with the environment. Uh, B.A. Haas is a very tough place to play. Uh, they are 110 uh, at that building since mm. uh, the start of the 09-10 season. 34-2 and two in their last non-conference home contest. I think that might include a win over the Zags. Not sure if that fell into that time frame or not. When you play in a tough building like that, what do you what do you have to do mentally to to handle? You got a tough team to deal with, but what do you have to do to handle the conditions? Well, I mean, we always described it as like a bunker mentality. I mean, you love it as a player. Uh, I, mean, I, I don't remember having a teammate who, who was not looking forward to going on the road and playing in an environment like that. It's way it's it's a much more pleasant experience than going to a, a big big gym and having it, you know, two thousand people in the gym. That's just weird. You feel like you can hear everything. There's just no juice. Um, and now it's much harder to try to create your own energy as a group. And I, you know, I've been in that situation many a times as a player where you're you're trying to fabricate a, a enthusiasm and, and, and an edge and an excitement, even though you know it's an important game. You're, there's, you're not you can't can't get that from anything external. That won't be a problem there. That will be it'll be loud, hostile, and I, I, these guys are going to love it. Um, you know, you have to be able to, I think, to navigate it, you know, particularly when you're on the floor, it can be a difficult time to, to communicate from sideline to, to on the floor. That's why it's, yeah, I, you don't really worry about that so much with Nemhard out there, certainly. I mean, he's got so much experience. He and, and Mark just seem to be reading from the same page at all times. Uh, but it's important to communicate. You know, you'll, you'll see, you should see these guys huddle up maybe a little bit more than you do at home, um, you know, in between free throws, coming out of timeouts. You'll see you know, Hickman and, and Nemhard more than likely run over to Mark during certain situations. Um, so you just have to communicate. But from a – just dealing with the atmosphere, like, you, you know, it's – for us, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning, they're playing here in a few hours. I guarantee you all these guys right now wish the game was in a, in a couple. You just – you're yeah. excited to play these games. It's it's it, This isn't this isn't a hard one to, to get yeah. ready for and, and, and to be dialed in and ready to play in. Yeah, I've, I've been in that building several times. It is loud, and for a home game, as compared to an NCAA tournament game, totally different environment. And, uh, you know, every bit as tough as, as the best venues on the West Coast, the, the McHale Center, uh, the McCarthy. You know, Oregon has a pretty good setup. UCLA, when they're rolling, has a pretty That's good a, setup. How, how, do you, how do you compare it to BYU's setup when, when they were in the league? Uh, just – Right there, right there yeah. with it. I love going to Provo because there's 20,000 people and and there wasn't a huge Gonzaga section in there like you see when they go play Pepperdine or mm -hmm. Portland. It's, uh, it's 19,800 BYU fans and, and this place will be very similar. A tough, tough place to uh, tough place to play, tougher when they have the personnel that they have. And that's where it's kind of a question mark tonight. They they may be missing a couple of key guys, may have one of those guys back. Talking about six, seven miles bird. Uh, he sprained his ankle a while back. It looks like he's been still favoring it, uh, getting close to practicing. But that's three, four days ago, so maybe he's made some strides. Um, it sounds like he probably won't play. We'll see. 
big games like this kind of have a magical healing effect on certain <laughs> players. <laughs> Got another uh, good player, uh, same, almost the same size. I think it's Reese Waters from USC. That's He's about 6'6". He might be an inch shorter, but he's an all-Mountain West Conference player. He had 22 against the Zags last year up at uh, Spokane. Uh, those are kind of their best two kids, but they got a kid from uh, Florida Atlantic, a, a point guard, Nick Boyd, who led that program to the Final Four uh, a couple years ago, as you remember. That was under Dusty May. Now the Owls are coached by John Jacobs, the former Gonzaga assistant who was at Baylor came to Gonzaga, went back to Baylor. Now he got the head job there. He lost a very good player to uh, San Diego State. And uh, he, he'll run the show. He's not a huge scorer, but he can score. Uh, another key player for them tonight will be uh, Wayne McKinney. He played at San Diego. So the Zags have seen him and know him. Uh, they know Waters. They know Bird if, if they end up playing. The rest of the cast is pretty new. Um you know, what do you make of – the key thing, too, is, is those two guys, Bird and Waters, that six 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 seven forward has given Gonzaga fits. Uh, you know, the last few years, Gonzaga has smaller guards. The USC exhibition, same thing, a lot of six five six six wings. Um, if they're available, it could really uh, be a difficult challenge if they're not. Uh, maybe a, a you know a tougher road for the Aztecs. What do you make of this matchup? It's a little hard to size it up when you're not sure who's out there. Yeah, it's hard because you know a San Diego State hasn't really played anybody yet. They just have two games under their belt, uh, and I know the season's young, but that's that's a pretty low number this early in, and they haven't played anybody of note. And then just with the injuries that that you're that you're talking about, I mean those are two big time scores, big time athletes. Um, you know, unfortunately, it, it may be a bit anticlimactic tonight where you just have a San Diego State team that's just not ready. They're not whole. Just, you know, but the one thing you know is they're going to guard and they're going to play hard. And what they do have is they have real size. Um, and I'm not sure. I mean, Arizona State's bigs were, were active, athletic, uh, but very finesse-oriented. This is the group in San Diego State that has not only size, but some real toughness around the basket. I think of Coleman Jones. Uh, transfer from Middle Tennessee State. He's had a good good start to the year. They've got uh, a freshman seven footer, uh, Magoon Guath. I think I don't know how you pronounce his name exactly, but just they they have real length around the basket, and just with they're going to guard. So Gonzaga is going to have a real challenge offensively, um, and I I think even with that San Diego State being a bit undermanned and not healthy. You know, this very well may be the best defensive test they've had to start the year. Um, so it, it's certainly going to be an exciting matchup. You know, a little disappointing um, that San Diego State's not where they're probably going to be in a, another 30 to 45 days. Uh, yeah. But still, nonetheless, a really good test. And I love how the schedule's opening up for Gonzaga, Jim, when you think about you're playing Baylor, top 10 team to start the year off. You've got a really scrappy, tough Arizona State. I know you know they were picked to finish towards the, the bottom of the Big 12, but I suspect if that vote happened today, they'd probably slide up a little higher. But I like what Arizona State represented to Gonzaga, which was a different way of playing, and they'd had to kind of solve that puzzle. UMass Lowell, obviously a, a game where they can kind of tweak tweak some things, but here you go, here you go again. You're going to play a true road game, and it's November 18th. Um, and not just a true road game, but to your point earlier, one of the toughest places to play on the West Coast, certainly, but maybe even in the country. So it's going to be a great opportunity for for, for the group. And I suspect they'll, they'll they'll find a way to to pull away with just how good they are and how depleted San Diego State is. But I still think it's going to be a very good test. Yeah, it, it's a whole different ball game if those two are healthy and playing. Uh, yeah. then, it's, then it's a real... Uh, you know, intriguing matchup because they those two can score, they can guard. That's the thing you get with San Diego State. You get guys who guard and rebound. Uh, that is guaranteed. That is, uh, you don't sign a scholarship paper unless you do those things <laughs> at San Diego State. Brian Dutcher is one of the better coaches that didn't get. I'm glad he got to the Final Four because he finally got some notoriety that he deserves. Uh, he has a system. Uh, much like Randy Bennett, but uh, 
uh, you know, with, with more success, especially in the NCAA tournament, he, he has a system, he recruits to it. He develops guys. Um, uh, you know, they, they, uh, they are for a formidable team. <clears throat> and the interesting thing too, is the Zags and Aztecs will be in the same conference in a couple of years, the PAC 12. So this is a, this is a rivalry that's going to grow because both teams are going to be very good. Both teams have great home venues where, Games should be played in college basketball as opposed to neutral sites. So we're, we better get used to this coming up. Uh, what do you think it comes down to tonight? Uh, boys, uh, defense, what what are some of the things you're going to have your eye on? Yeah, look, I, I think it takes a minute to unlock or to solve a puzzle like like, like what San Diego State's going to present defensively. I mean, Gonzaga's played them plenty. You know, it, it's not as if they're going to have some radical new uh, scheme, but th- they'll be – and, and, and adjustments in that first 20 minutes that Gonzaga is going to have to figure out. Um, yeah. Certainly feel good having them hard out there that you're going to figure that that out relatively quickly, hopefully, you know, in, with the firepower they have. Um, to me, it, it, and I'm going to sound like a broken record on the podcast throughout the year, it will be defensively. Can they make life difficult for San Diego State? Because even if they, when they have everybody, they always struggle to score a little bit, just the way yeah. they like to play. Can they make life very, very difficult for San Diego State on on their offensive end, and then rebounding? You know, Gonzaga has been solid on the glass this year. Can they win that that number? Can can they keep the second chance opportunities for San Diego State? Because every time a shot goes up, they're not just sending their post play. I mean, everybody goes to the bat to the rim. Um, and I have seen plenty of San Diego State games where their best offense has been the glass. So can you know? So to me, it's. You know, can you can you eliminate or reduce those easy ba- basket or looks for San Diego State? Can you clean up, finish the defensive possession, and then how long does it take for Gonzaga to get going offensively? Because they, they're going to get going, they're going to have a run. They just they're too talented on that end of the floor offensively. I think for really anybody in the country to slow them down for forty minutes. So, you know, I, I'm looking for that, and you know, I think on if we're looking at guys individually, I'm really looking forward to seeing how Graham plays. Um, yeah. you'd made this comment to me, you know, he, at the, at the game the other night, you know, he's zero for four, I think you said, or maybe zero for five against San Diego State. It's five. I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, I said, yeah, you mentioned that it, it, it's, it's important to him to uh, get one on those guys. <laughs> so I, 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 and Graham hasn't had the best start to the season. I mean, he's only averaging 17 minutes a game. Um, yeah. and it just has felt a little off, you know, he's too good and too, you know, he's a pro. I mean, he just, his approach is the same. I'm not worried about Graham's season. You know, he's just too talented, too good, too tough, all the, all those things, but it's been a bit of a rocky start. You know, he just hasn't really taken off yet. Uh, yeah. I really hope for him it's tonight. I hope he just has a Graham EK game where he gets 22, 24 minutes and he's got 18, 20 points. And he just looks like he, like he, like the Graham that we expect and that we'll see at some point, if not tonight. Yeah, and you're right. He he hasn't had – he's missed more close-range shots, great shots, you know, from five feet, seven feet, that he's usually money on, uh, you know, than I can recall. Uh, he, you know, every guy has ups and downs. I mean, Battle's going to have stretches where he's not hitting threes and and what have you, but he, he's missed more close-range shots than, than we're accustomed to, and that's one of the things he has, him and Huff that touch around the hoop when it hits that rim, it just falls in a lot. Of yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep, yep. So it's still in there. It's just a matter of bringing it out. And tonight would be a big night for him to do that. That kind of leads us into the next topic. I can talk about the rotation and this will be uh, a frequent topic, I think, just because they've, they've tweaked it more than they usually do. They've made changes mid game, starting a different second half unit than the first half. And in the last game, you had uh, Michael Ajayi back in as the starter. He started both exhibitions, and then Ben Gregg was the starter for the first couple games of the regular season. Uh, Ajayi gets back in the lineup. Uh, I get the sense this might stay for a little while this way, you know, provided somebody doesn't go into a slump or somebody doesn't go for 35 tonight. Um, because he, he's, uh, you know, he's playing well, and so is Benny. But I feel like, uh, uh, you know, they know what they have with Ben coming off the bench. He's been, you know, a maestro coming off the bench for uh, a lot of his career. 
and they know he can start. So either way, they're in great shape if he starts or not. But and you're gonna see this too. You saw it with EK and Huff. You mentioned EK's playing time the other day. Uh, you know, if if a guy's playing better, doesn't matter if he starts or or comes mm-hmm. off the bench, you gotta play more. And if you ask Mark, he is much more caught up in who's playing at crunch time, who's playing maybe the majority of minutes, not just who gets their name announced with the first five. Uh, That's kind of the distinguishing factor for him. Uh, In fact, he kind of grows tired of these questions on the starting five. I can, I can, uh, I can say that with that. So I think (laughs) Michael will stay in the starting lineup if he's playing well. Um, Again, I think Benny played over 22 minutes. Michael played 17. Huff has played more minutes than EK in some of the games. If Battle has a bad night, you might see Stromer, uh, you know, play as many minutes or more. Uh, You know, if Hickman's not going well, you might see Battle play the two and then another, you know, Michael at the three, and then they can go big. Whatever uh, combinations you want. Uh, do you think this one will last a little longer or is it just still experimenting for the staff with this this five? The, I think the eight-man rotation is – it isn't set in stone either, but I think it's been pretty concrete so far. Do you think they'll keep tinkering or is this one going to stick? I mean, look, it's not common, but it's certainly not unheard of to have a situation where you, you change your starting lineup relatively frequently based on matchups. Certainly, Mark was around that for the for the Olympic team. Um, I had a team like that in Europe. Um, and I, I, I think if you're communicating to to your your players the reasoning behind shifting that, um, no one has a problem with it. And Mark's absolutely right. Every player would rather be – every any good player would rather be in the game at the end of the game if they had to pick over starting the game. So – um, I, I just don't know how how much of an issue that it's going to be. I, I don't know if they're going to change things up. I think you make a, a good point about you know Ben. Certainly, there's a, I think he does represent a bit of a security blanket for the group, uh, the, the staff, and that they they just have a lot of trust and equity with him. I mean, you can't help but not given how long he's been here, and he's played in some big games, and the majority of his career has come off the bench, and. Um, you know, he's a starting level player. Now I'm bringing him off the bench, and now my matchup, he's got an advantage in theory, both in size, strength, and ability when he comes in and he's matched up with someone's second unit. Yeah. And then, you know, and then I, I just think with, uh, with Ajayi does, is, even though I think Ben holds up really well defensively when he gets switched out to, to smalls, obviously Michael's very gifted in that way very similar to what Anton ended up being defensively, which was he could be on an island with a point guard and you felt like he could hold up. And so I, I think it might strengthen your, your group defensively, the starting group having Michael out there to start games. But I don't think it really matters. You know, it, it Ben's 0 of 6 from 3. If he was 4 of 6, he probably he might still be starting because his numbers might look different and his impact might feel a little bit different offensively. You know, we're three games in. The same thing with Graham. You know, he's shooting – a terrible 50% from the field. I mean, think about that. He's like, God, I mean, he's missing all these shots. He's shooting 50% from the field. I mean, the benchmark of a good shooter. 50%. Right. But we're like, we feel like he should be 65, 70. Um, I mean, talk about a first world problem. So yeah. I, I just think all this is going to sort itself out. And I do think it's going to be matchup dependent. I mean, you know, the San Diego State's big. They may not have the firepower offensively, but I want size out there. This might be, you know, we might be talking next week about this game and saying, wow, Ben was awesome. He played 29 minutes because he stretched their bigs. They couldn't guard him, and he was all over the place, and he had 16 points, seven rebounds, and four assists, you know, and and, and Michael got into foul trouble. Okay, you know, like, it just uh, – so long – I said this last week, and I, I'm going to maintain this all year, Jim. That's the challenge for the staff, and the, the thing they have to work on the most – is just the communication and getting all these guys to continue to believe and to buy in. And clearly they are still up to this point that all that noise doesn't matter. Let's win tonight. Let's win this game. Let's get better every week. Um, and let's see where we are in March. If, if, if they're at a final four, everyone's getting shine. It doesn't matter. You know what I mean? So I I think they've done a really good job with that. They just got to keep doing that. Well, and, and look, and I, I'm, I don't think it's an issue. I think it's just interesting that they're tinkering a little more than they usually do. 
Uh, and I think both those guys tonight, especially with EK, are very important and battle because they've got a, a – I, I think it's almost like Baylor. You want to at least get a draw on the glass yeah. uh, against San Diego State because uh, they go after every ball uh, with passion. Mm-hmm. And they've got the bodies to move you and, and go get it. And that's why – and Michael is a – he is a gifted rebounder. He's just one of those guys that he – and he doesn't give up on any ball. Benny is too. For minutes played, Benny goes and gets it, makes all the hustle plays. Uh, you might see both of them together tonight is what is kind of what I'm getting at because they, they need that glass taken care of tonight. And they need Graham to get, you know, well, 7, what, 8, 10 if he can. What's been interesting – and I, I'm sure that Michael and Greg have played together. I'm sure they've had some minutes, but it has felt it has felt as if they've married up Greg and EK for large stretches while they're out there on the floor. Yeah. Um, I think that's a really interesting way to play is to have Michael and Ben out there at the same time. Because you're absolutely right. They're they're two best rebounders, both area. In other words, if the ball comes, but if the ball is just outside of the area, he's not great at going to go get it. And and Huff now, I think you know he's he's improvement. He's clearly much stronger than he was last year. He's taken a huge jump defensively. But I would not call Braden a good rebounder yet. No, I mean if it's right there, he'll get it. But he, he's not he's not a elite. He's not a, at a grand level of just controlling his area. But Michael and Ben are just everywhere. And part of that is where they start a lot of possessions when the shot goes a start. Where they start on the floor when a shot goes up is they're on the perimeter. Well, they put their head down and they fly in there. Yeah. Um, that's an interesting look to have both of them together just because now you've got five out, true five out. They can both shoot. Um, they can both pass and the way that they rebound, it just, it really spreads out a defense. So I, you just had me thinking about that. I'm sure that they have, they've, they've shared the floor, but I don't think it's been for a prolonged period of time, at least not that I can remember. No, I think you're right. And then it, it seems like tonight of, of the, any of the first few games here, including Baylor, which they did more of, you might see those three bigs together, whatever the combo is, you know, Michael, Ben and Graham or Huff for Graham, you know, one of those, but three bigs, because that's, I think that's how important the glass is tonight. Uh, if they can do it with, with battle at the wing and, and hold up on the glass, I'm sure they, you know, that's obviously the first option they'll go with. But I think that uh, flexibility that uh, is very important to them. And tonight it could be very important just because the opponent might demand it. Uh, one more topic to cover, you know, last few teams have been a little more quiet. Uh, you know, since Drew Timmy graduated, that that was the, <laughs> the spark, the live wire for four years. Now, you know, and then you had Anton, who was a great leader, but but a little quieter than than uh, probably Drew was. On this team, you've got Ryan, Nolan, Stromer, Huff. Uh, you know, all terrific players, but but not the loudest guys of all time. I think Ryan's being uh, a little louder now this year, and I think Nolan is being a little louder this year. But really, uh, that's one thing I think Caliph Battle has added is that personality that, uh, you know, you can just tell he is 100% involved. And when he gets going, you know, the the, the DeMontis, you know, pump me up flex and, and the crowd, playing to the crowd. I think Graham does that a little more too. He's a little more demonstrative. Uh, this team compared to the last team, might have a little more outgoing uh, personality and a little more on on court fire. You think? Well, that that's, that group last year is pretty stoic. I, I, yep. I think I'm not sure that's a high hurdle. Um, great team, <laughs> obviously, but just yeah, pretty you know workmanlike. You know, put the hard hat on last year. Um, I mean, they, you know, it, whenever particularly Anton got animated, you would really jarred you. You thought. Um, I mean, certainly this the, the the enthusiasm battle brings and Graham, uh, I've, you know, Ryan will do that too. Um, you know, even the young kids, Stromer and Huff, will have a moment. You know, they, they a big, you know, kind of let out a big scream. That's yeah. more my my speed. Certainly, the kind of how you know I remember my group being and and how I was to be quite honest. 
Um, I like that. I, I like having that juice. You know, it feels to me like Battle wants to talk more than he does on the floor. You know, he, <laughs> I think he's still fitting in. But I mean, every once in a while, you'll see him. He'll hit a shot. He'll turn to the, the, the opposing bench. Or he'll look at a guy, and you can tell he's saying something, but it's maybe not as 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 demonstrative as it might have been last year, or maybe some of his other stops. I, I think you, I think you want to have that kind of pest. I, I think you want a guy who's willing to say something um, and get under the other team's skin. Um, but yeah, this this group, I mean. The, this just the cohesion that they have. I mean, they bring so many of these guys back, and and both Michael and and Battle seem like they have just seamlessly folded into the, to what it is they're trying to do. And you know, it, it seems it just seems like a very close knit group. I mean, that's been something Gonzaga's done since the beginning. Yeah. Is they I mean, outside of maybe a two, three, four year stretch where um, maybe talent outweighed. That, that chemistry piece, just like by 1%, um, they have always, always maintained from what, from what I can see that if you don't fit, you can't be here. So if you, if your personality doesn't fit, if the way you play doesn't fit, um, you know, as talented as you might be, you know, we can't rock the boat that way. And clearly both Ajayi and, and, and Khalif have fit in. It's been remarkable. Well, what I like too is is it it's it's not forced. I mean, Battle just has that, and he's lived a lot of life. He, he, you think he's about that, yeah. What five schools, six years of college? Uh, I asked him about it the other day, transitioning to Gonzaga. He said, "I'm old, man. I'm old," and I think that comes through. He's had a lot of experiences. So uh, you've got the calm, cool, collected guys. Ryan, Nolan, Anton was like that. And then you got the guys who, you know, that's, I think they just stand true to their nature, basically. And that's what Battle and EK do. That mixture is what you need. You need some guys who are, you know, going to get after you in the huddle. And you need some guys who are going to pat you on the back and say, don't worry about that turnover. So, anyway, I think that's going to do it for today, Foxy. Uh, you can find us all over. I'll post the, uh, the, uh, the show on our website, spokesman.com. I think we're on Apple, we're on Spotify. Spreaker, you, you can find us out there. And we <laughs> we hope you do. We enjoy bringing it to you. We thank Christy Burns as always for uh, trying to make us look good. Foxy, that's that's the toughest job in the world, isn't it? Yeah, I I, I don't know why she tries it all, man. Honestly, it's a lost lost cause. Hey, thankfully we have her. So anyway, we're back next Monday. We'll have a couple games to recap, and we will talk about the Bahamas tournament. Uh, I'm sort of looking forward to that trip, to tell you the truth, Foxy. You want, you know, to, come? Looking... You want me to pack you in my luggage? Hmm? No, my, my wife is running me through uh, the plan for Thanksgiving Day, and I'd rather uh, be on my couch, uh, <laughs> hope, maybe see you on TV and watch the game. But uh, I, 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 I'm i excited for you. You're taking them with you, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, we yeah. are. And uh, we've done it once before, so we'll we'll both be there for that uh Three games might be Tommy Lloyd, might be Omar Ballo. We'll see. Be crazy. Be crazy. Uh, thanks for joining us. Come back next Monday. Take care.